Hello, we are here with Wes Sherman for the Now Gallery Talk at M Galleries. Hi, Wes. Hello. Hello. <laughs> yeah, so do you want to just jump into a little bit about your background as an artist? Uh, yeah, I, um, I've been painting for about 30 years now. I uh, always kind of marked 1992 as the year I started painting, which is after uh, undergraduate uh, school. Um, where I got a science, degree in science um, mm -hmm. of some sort. But uh, um, I was young and married and my uh, wife said, hey, let's go to a museum. I'd never been to one. We went to the Contemporary Art Museum in Houston. And uh, I was very much blown away. And shortly after that, I started painting. And even shorter after that, I felt like I was like, I think I'm an artist. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of where it all began. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned in your write-up about uh, me uh, having a an exhibition with Kenneth, or meet, meeting um, Kenneth Nolan's work. Right? Yeah, that was, yeah. At, that was at that exhibition where um, uh, he, he had a retrospective of his work and uh, it, his stuff is pretty uh, minimal and uh, pretty highbrow mm -hmm. as, as minimalism goes. And uh, being a novice, I just didn't understand it. And <laughs> uh, so, you know, the idea of, uh, you know, why is this on the walls? Mm -hmm. and, I trust this institution, so I should probably figure out why it's on the walls, mm, mm. and um, and that kind of wonderful mystery kind of launched my curiosity that uh, has sustained me as a painter to this day. And uh, how did uh, how did Vonda? What did she think of the show? Uh, she, I, well, uh, she was definitely more uh, sophisticated than I was <laughs> in our twenties, and uh, so she she kind of was like, yeah, I understand what's happening here, and she you know. Helped uh, kind of see, help me see the world in a new place, and pointed me in some directions of things I could read, and that, that was kind of the beginning. Mm. Nice, nice. All right, could you unpack the title of the show? Oh yeah, so um, M Gallery here in Washington, New Jersey, has been really kind to give me two of their gallery spaces for this exhibition. So uh, the space we're in right now is uh, half the show, and this is the now part. Uh, the work that's in this part are the most recent things I've been painting. And then the other location is uh, the then part of now and then. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the work there is uh, about 20 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Very nice. So do you want to talk about your art influences? Um, as far as my influences go, uh, early on uh, I was influenced by a painter named Terry Thacker uh, mm -hmm. out of Nashville, Tennessee. And um, he immediately in introduced me to dozens of artists that um, I should consider, but two that we talked about a lot and two that I still think about uh, frequently is uh, Jasper Johns and then uh, the great abstract painter Thomas Naskowski. Mm -hmm. And uh, later uh, uh, I get the honor to meet Jasper Johns at an opening. I was introduced to him and that was delightful. And, uh, and then uh, I got to study with uh, Naskowski yeah. at uh, the Mason Gross School of the Arts at Rutgers University uh, when I was doing my master's degree. So. Yeah, what an opportunity. Did, uh, did Jasper Johns impart any wisdom upon you? Uh, he in was that, kind. <laughs> Let's just say, I don't remember much of it. You know, you meet your hero and, and uh, you, you just hope that they're kind and he was super kind and I'm sure I embarrassed myself and then I uh, got out of there, so. <laughs> and what about Tom? Like, what was Tom's biggest takeaway? Uh, Tom was super generous. Uh, he would come to the studio uh, at least once a week, if not twice, and, and uh, let me talk to him about painting and uh, not just my work, but painting at, at large. And uh, he would let me ask any question possible. And uh, he was just always really generous with his time and his little gems of wisdom. Um, I would say the one thing Tom really taught me to do is uh, to look and see. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, kind of the difference between looking and seeing. Uh, uh, to look at something's kind of passive, to see it as more active. So. so since we talked about your art influences, can you talk about your non-art influences? Oh, that's a good question. Um, non-art influence, I, I guess when you say art influence, I'm always thinking painters, but you know, um, a non-painter influence would be uh, the director, um, John Ford, Mm -hmm. I, I like uh, the way that he would frame images in his uh, movies. And uh, I, I've heard it said that before he would start a shot, he would ask himself as a way of setting up the narrative for what he's doing, is this about the ground or is this about the sky? And so the angle of his camera then would determine 
it, you see a lot more ground or a lot more sky. And, um, so when I started painting, I often think, you know, what's, what's the narrative that I'm going to tell here? Is this going to be a, a narrative about the sky or the ground? And then that will set up the composition uh, for me. So that would be a non-painterly uh, way of uh, maybe saying it. Um, other influences, I was a track and cross country runner in uh, college, and I would just say the discipline of showing up every day to practice and, and you know, uh, going through the grind of, of running is um, a great setup for the practice of being an artist and being in the studio. You know, show up regardless of how you feel and you're not waiting for inspiration, you just know you need that muscle memory uh, to, to be there. And so um, I've always thought that uh, athletics uh, in my life have, was, has been a big influence uh, on the work as well. You know. Very good. Do you still run? I don't run very much. I, I uh, <laughs> maybe run occasionally, but mostly hiking and uh, uh, walking. And I love to rock climb, so I rock climb. So. Mm -hmm. And how does that inform the work? You know, the uh, the activity of, of being in nature. You know, obviously there's a direct connection, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I, the landscapes that I'm doing here definitely are me trying to connect to nature and. Um, when I do run, I like to trail run because you have to be in the moment, you have to be present, because if you don't, you're gonna trip over a rock or over a, a root or, or something. Climbing, definitely have to be in the moment uh, and working. And um, when you're street running, you can kind of zone out because you hopefully have a smooth place. And that, there's nothing wrong with that, but when I'm painting, I like to try to be fully present for the work. Uh, in that kind of weird hippy dippy way, I like to listen to what the paintings are saying, reacting to what's happening on the surface. Because um, most of the marks I make are never right. Mm -hmm. I make them and then I have to react to them. And uh, it's because I'm, I'm going in without a, an agenda. I'm, mm -hmm. I, I have, a, have a goal in mind, make a painting, make a landscape painting. Uh, I may even have a composition in mind but the composition gets laid down in a couple of seconds, maybe a minute at most to map it out. And then I just start to put paint on it, uh, be it something that's already left on my palette that I want to use up the paint, or mm -hmm. I, if it, that's not there, I'll use uh, a cadmium red light, which is a pretty garish red in my <laughs> opinion. Uh, and then I just start to react to what's that and try to push and pull and um, try to move away from drawing. I think all paintings begin as drawings but I want to end as a painting. And, mm -hmm. and uh, I like trying to figure out what is the relationship between drawing and painting and when does it shift away from drawing into just painting and, and uh, th th those kind of ideas. So. so can you talk about the other media you like to work in since we touched on drawing earlier? Oh uh, yeah, um, I, I don't work in a lot of different mediums. I'm not a... Uh, Photographer. I'm not a you know video maker. Uh, I'm a drawer and a painter. Mm -hmm. And um, so if I do anything other, uh, I see it as I'm, I make oil paintings, and then I might on the side make a watercolor uh, painting, or I might make a graphite drawing or a color pencil drawing. Um, and I do a lot of those things, but they're more of a setup for to get to this this mm -hmm. the idea of a painting. Um, that I'm working on and uh, it's in that drawing phase that um, I, I'm exploring and, and considering ideas uh, that I can then execute in a painting. Mm -hmm. um, the word drawing for me uh, is to, the, to take away and so when I'm drawing I'm, I'm trying to uh, take something from nature, uh, from my observations of the world and, and then put that on a two-dimensional surface of a drawing of some sort. Painting, I think, is like an editing to drawing. I think if I'm doing drawing right, it's fully honest mm -hmm. and true, um, but if I'm um, painting, I'm taking that honesty and that truth and I am editing it so that um, I'm telling a story. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes a story needs to be uh, embellished to get the kernel of truth through it. And so the the painting part of it for me is the embellishment of what I hopefully saw that was authentic or true, and, and the drawing hopefully is authentic and true in that in that process as well. Okay. Having taken a class with you, yes, I think that there's a, a reference in the bottom 
left. Yeah, yeah. Do you remember who it was? I don't remember her name. Yeah, so but that, I, I remember you being like, this yeah. is a, a cool thing. <laughs> well, so we're talking about Ilsa Murdoch, and Ilsa is so much better at what this is uh, than what I've done here. So I'm thinking I'm, I'm pulling two ideas. Uh, the way uh, Ilsa Murdoch will use the palette in the, in the, on the canvas to make paintings, which I love that she just did this, and I, I adore her paintings. But the other is uh, it's a kind of a value scale or a color blocking kind of scale, uh, which you see in say Jasper John's work, uh, and you might see it in other artists' work. And so it is a double reference there for me, is uh, kind of uh, that scale. And then of course, uh, if you've ever uh, looked at a print, uh, they'll have a color scale at the bottom of print. So it's also kind of referencing uh, graphic design in that way as well. So when I did it, I was holding those three thoughts in, in mind, but definitely it is an homage to uh, Issa Murdoch and um, Jasper Johns uh, in that regard. So, a little tip of the hat. <laughs> All right, so do you want to talk about your color choices? Yeah, color. Uh, you know, um, <laughs> when I was in graduate school, uh, the thing that uh, Thomas Noskowski uh, kind of dogged me about the most was how bad my color choices were. <laughs> um, and, and so I, I always hear him in my ear when I'm uh, when I'm making color choices. Um, I tend to navigate towards muddy, earthy colors, and I think that's because nature for the most part is earthy in its nature, so there's not a real high pop of a color, like you might get in a, a Liechtenstein or, or a Warhol or something like that, but um, there is a, a kind of a, an earthy tone, which is like an old master earthy tone. Uh, where you do an underpainting, usually in the browns, and those browns will affect the colors that come on top. And, and so, um, because these are of landscapes, I'd like to try to play with those um, earthy tones. And, um, yeah. no is question? That, is that, you, had, you want to add to that? Um, well, it, it was mostly process. I wanted to understand that your mental process and what makes you choose colors. Oh yeah. But you kind of answered that. But but they, they, your work does have this kind of. Even your landscapes have this very surreal quality to them, even mm -hmm. though you're tapping into, like you said, your color choices are kind of determined by nature. Mm -hmm. But they are not. Um, they are, you know, a degree or two separated from the reality of nature. Mm -hmm. So when you is that something that's very intentional in your mind when you're creating a piece, or is it something that happens very organically? Because when yeah. I create, I get into a very zen-like meditative state where I'm not really thinking about what I'm doing, I'm just looking, and if it appeals to me visually, mm -hmm. or it feels, or it, it, anything that sits well with me ends up on the paper or mm -hmm. in my sculpture. So what is your process? That's that? a great question. Um, so when it comes to color, um, there's two things that happen at the beginning, and it's an either or. Uh, either the, the uh, canvas is uh, the white of the gesso and I have a fresh new palette, uh, and there's just me starting out with, no, with as many choices as I want. And if that's the case, then I always go to cadmium red light, which is this garish, orangey red color, which, um, it's hard to work with a little bit, so I start every painting there because I want to struggle to bring it out of that that space and into something different. But I also am uh, kind of uh, frugal with my paints, so if I have leftover paints on my palette that are still wet, then I'll start with those, and that could be a, a mirage, a, a, a range of colors that uh, could be there. Uh, and, um, and so I start there with the underdrawing, but then there is a, a kind of a choice. Um, and one, a couple of choices that I make is one, I like to have a residue of where I've begun. So you can kind of look around the shapes and, and in the edges where things meet up, see that thin slither of beginning of colors uh, that are there. Um, and then I, as the painting is progressing, um, I would say there is a, a feeling like this one color is really exciting to me, and so I'll, I'll lock in on it. But then I get pretty analytical. I pull out the color wheel, I look at my color wheel, mm -hmm. I start to make choices with um, 
uh, you know, complementary, analogous, split complementary, so all the different kinds of things you can have on, a, on those kind of choices to then push towards a, an end. Um, but I like to not plan out a painting, I, I, other than go, hey, I'm gonna do a landscape, and oh, it might be this thing. Um, but once the composition is established, and that's usually established within a couple minutes of starting a painting, then I just like to react and be in the moment to what's there, um, be it shapes, lines, and color, um, mm -hmm. and value. You know, um, I don't always start out with a, a night sky. You know, like I don't go, hey, I'm gonna make a a, a nocturnal painting today. I, I just kind of start painting, and it'll say this is daylight or this is not daylight or or whatever it is as I'm in the process. But then there's this tipping point, and it says, here's what I am. Bring me to the end. Mm -hmm. Then I listen to the muse and take it to the end. So. Are any of these plain air? A number of them are plain air. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Six of the wow. ten. Seven of the ten. The one behind you. Seven. Yeah. This is. This is not. Okay. This is. This is. That's a, actually one of my favorites. I, I like that curious. one a lot. Not a COVID painting, or it's a COVID painting, but not an in plein air painting. Okay. This is Lake George. That's my yard. <laughs> this I is Rutgers uh, Garden. I mean, I, they're oh, all very specific places, and um, we're started there uh, and then you know then they get screwed around with in the studio nice yeah I love your color choices behind you thank you that one yeah the closer you get the more um, the richer it becomes thank you yeah no. I love it so I noticed you have a lot of pattern repetition mm -hmm. in this one in particular yeah. so I'd like to hear what you're thinking about when you painted that Okay. Um, well, when, with patterns in general, I, um, I think that we're surrounded with patterns and repetition. And so I'm really interested in uh, patterns and repetitions. I like patterns and repetitions that go awry, uh, that there's a system that's there, but then the system gets broken or, or misshapen. And, um, and so in the work in general, there's gonna often be a pattern or, or something in there. Uh, sometimes it's a pattern that I impose on it um, that um, I'm thinking about because I just like the way the pattern looks. Others, like this one behind me, um, might have a reference in nature in some fashion, uh, and then I will, you know, have fun with it and mess around with it and tweak it and try to present it in a way um, that hopefully is unique and also um, uh, curious. So. Well, this one in particular, I, I love. And so it's, can you explain, is it like time folding out and you're seeing time represented like all at once in the surface, right? You know, with the, this, the, the movement of the moon, you know? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I think about, I, I think it, hope I'm getting this right. I think that time is like the fourth dimension. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, um, and so, you know, we're painting a two dimensional thing, maybe of a three dimensional world. And I think what is fun or, to try to do is to try to capture a fourth dimension. Mm -hmm. And I think in, in this case, because of uh, the where the location of this pattern in the above, that it has a time element to mm -hmm. it. Um, that's not true with everything, but um, I do like to have that feeling of, of you're moving through time with the work in some fashion. So. In your artist statement, exploring why you would transition from abstract, which you did prior and you fell in love with, to transition into painting, landscape painting, I mean this year, you said you went through a studio crisis. So maybe you can clarify what that means? Absolutely. Um, so I'm gonna talk to the camera on this part and I'll give a little pause here for that. So I can edit. Um, yeah, so the idea of uh, a crisis in the studio for me, uh, I'm playing on a term like a crisis of faith uh, the, uh, my dad is uh, an evangelical minister, and um, so um, that idea of faith and going through a crisis uh, of, of a spiritual awakening of sorts is um, kind of what I'm referencing uh, in that regard because I was going through a, a level of self-doubt. Um, the work that comes before this, the show being uh, now and then, the then part is 
work 20 years ago that is abstract. And um, as I said in my artist statement that I felt like I came late to the party. Mm -hmm. uh, abstraction for me is, feels like a 20th century idea. And um, after having studied with Thomas Moskowski and then being a studio assistant for Gary Steffen, two very different abstract painters, but maybe some of the best abstract painting uh, of our time, uh, and then you know, now part Gary uh, is still with us, and uh, Tom passed a few years ago, but they're, they were uh, so good at what they did, and they definitely were there at the, at the bones of the beginnings of these 20th century ideas of abstraction that I felt that I was coming in and was just kind of holding on to their coattail. Uh, and so um, I was thinking I need to maybe be more authentic to my time, the tw a 21st century artist. Uh, and, and what does that mean? And uh, it took me a couple years to go through it because I had a lot of self-identity in abstraction. I had a, a, a a, a reputation, let's say, of being an abstract painter and, uh, and having to convince myself that there, there was this other thing that maybe I could go for. And so um, I took a few years to get through, uh, but it ended up in these landscape kind of paintings, which I think are more, uh, a, a, more a part of me because I love being in nature. I love uh, the idea of uh, landscapes and, and how that, that is uh, at the root of where we are, you know, we're always in nature. Mm -hmm. No one owns nature, mm -hmm. kind of idea. So. Okay. That, that transition you know, from from a being. Now I do know. Listen, I follow passion, passion, and I'm hearing you. And I've read, I've been both, and I saw both, and I have been in both places. So your work over there is extremely profound and very good. So I wonder when Thank you me. when you <laughs> started to. Yes, you're a very good artist, but also you have a background similar to mine. I have a degree in biochemistry, so I'm hearing, reading about physiology and biology, and then you became an artist, which really is intriguing. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it was that kind of passion to change from that field to art and then paint for the next 10 years. I don't understand how that is something that somehow would phase out mm -hmm. because you weren't making the grade and where you, where you sound, but you, your work is phenomenal. So I don't understand where that <laughs> thought came into place. Yeah. If this is a complete transition where you didn't feel like you were moving forward, but what you did there is astounding. Thank you. And and mm -hmm. I was there again today because I wanted to confirm what I was thinking. Because uh -huh. I have to like so I don't I, just changing that much to get into something profound between your wife and that guy and that Milikowski or whatever it is. Yeah. I'm not the names he does. <laughs> Ken, it's called Ken. But not that I know him. But to transition into this, um, it, so this was a life experience. Like you said, you transitioned because of you kind of looked inward more. So that yeah, absolutely. Is, is, that, is that what you're saying? Yeah, absolutely. I definitely was um, trying to be more authentic to who I was. I, I would say that the abstract work um, it was very analytical, mm -hmm. um, and I was kind of unpacking uh, abstraction uh, and, and painting in a very uh, systematic way to to achieve something. And I and those paintings, they're you know they're uniquely mine, but um, but the idea of um, non-representation didn't seem to be something that I think the 21st century is interested in. And so trying to be as contemporary as possible, I, I, I was noticing and, and being tugged in my emotions, let's say, mm -hmm. towards something more representational. And I think uh, a more 21st century idea is taking representation and abstractions and finding that Venn diagram uh, layover mm -hmm. And I think that the work here maybe has that. There's the element of the landscape, but there's the element of the abstraction that's there. So you're talking about what you said here is that once I'm taking again, you were not against you. It's your relevance seemed to be different. You had it, it was a different kind of relevance, where the other one was something that you know, I mean, because you have to be um, analytical to be scientific. Mm -hmm. So you were like changing. Yeah, absolutely. So that's why this happened. Yeah, I definitely would say there was a metamorphosis that was taking place for sure. Uh, you know, I, 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 that work for me, I, I felt as though I had um, painted into a corner and I couldn't figure out how to get out of the corner. And, um, and I wonder, and I still wonder, you know, it was, does abstraction, not just for me, but in general, does it have anywhere really to go for a while? Does it need to go dormant before it can be re, 
uh, reinvented, and I couldn't figure out how to reinvent what had been around for most of the 20th century. So um, instead of trying to reinvent, I deviated towards something that I also was very uh, authentically passionate about, which is being in nature and being and painting and representing nature. Yeah. Uh, so you want to just uh, take us home, Wes, with uh, this last grouping we have here? Sure. Uh, one of the questions that was asked uh, was kind of like location for, for these. And this one right here is probably the most benign of them. Others are like these pristine places. But this is a parking lot at Raritan Valley Community <laughs> College where I'm an adjunct teacher. Um, and so um, when I teach a, an in plain air class, I tend to set up in the middle of where everybody else will be. So oftentimes I end up in the parking lot and then I can paint and then walk off and talk to my students. And so I have to try to make something interesting in a sense out of nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so um, uh, it's a really modernist idea that you can paint anything and make it interesting. Mm -hmm. You don't have to go looking for um, you know, the, the beauty or the, or the weird or the mm -hmm. whatever, that everything is content and, and, and it's how you come to it and how you interact with it that really matters and then how you manipulate the materials to, to make a painting. And so um, as an in plain air painter, you can't get much more boring than being in a parking lot. And I'm literally looking at the, the burnt grass on the side of the, <laughs> right by the, you know, uh, stump that you stop your car on. And I just was like, here's some shadows, here's some lights, lights and darks. Just paint that because mm. I'm not going to have a lot of time to really focus on it because I'm going to walk around and talk to students and um, throw in a weird shape, which I was thinking about. The, that curved line has been mm. uh, kind of in the work for a bit. And uh, where do you go? Throw these two things on the same canvas and, and figure out what happens. And so that's uh, probably the most, uh, you know, non romantic place I painted, so. <laughs> Love that. Well, thank you so much, Wes. Thank you.